Hi students, welcome to My Rank Tuitions Physiology. We are talking about gastrointestinal physiology. I am Dr. Ashwin. We learned about the various gastrointestinal secretions, the salivary, the gastric, the pancreas, intestinal. We also learned about the secretion of the bile from the liver. But the point is, we must understand the structure and functions of the liver and gallbladder in certain detail so that we will be able to know how intricate and how complex are the anatomical, histological and the biochemical reactions which are happening in the liver. And liver happens to be one of the most important organs in our body, especially concerned with digestion and absorption. Okay. Is it only with digestion and absorption or does it do anything else? We will learn it in this class. Coming to exam point of view, liver and gallbladder is usually an essay question from the GIT. Okay. So the question will directly come like a descriptive question. Uh, briefly describe about the hepatic lobule and the formation of the bile, functions of the bile or functions of the liver and so on and add a note on jaundice. Or the question can come as a clinical scenario wherein it will be asked, a middle-aged man uh, is, has come to hospital with a, a LOH discoloration in the sclera and the skin. And then the doctor suspected jaundice and the laboratory report is like this. The direct bilirubin so and so, indirect is so and so. Now it will be asked to you, comment on the condition of the person and give your differential diagnosis. Okay, the term that will be used is differential diagnosis. That means you will be able to tell what all possible conditions can lead to that. So what we will do in today's lecture is that we will spend a significant amount of time in the last sections of our class where I will be telling you the differential diagnosis of jaundice. Okay. Uh, that's an important uh, thing for you, which you can make a note in your textbook then and there. And the others will be certain descriptive points what we are going to learn. We will start today's class by knowing the functional anatomy of liver. Liver is a wonderful organ. I say it as wonderful organ because if you damage the liver to an extent, it has the capability of regeneration. It is said that the right and the left lobes of liver, what we have, probably by this time you must have dissected the liver and carried it in your hands. Okay. So it has a bigger right lobe and a left lobe, a smaller left lobe. Uh, the point in the regeneration, what they say is two thirds of the liver is actually extra, which is there with us. It is enough that you can survive with one third of the liver. This reserve principle is not new to liver. It is there everywhere in the body. Even one kidney is sufficient for us. One lung is sufficient for us. The others are only just for reserve. Okay. So now coming to the liver, if the liver is damaged or insulted, as I told, it has a capability for regeneration. So it will grow on its own but there is a condition. The liver has actually grown into a lattice or a network, okay, which is already created and the cells were nicely going into it and then they got arranged. If that network or lattice or an extracellular matrix support is gone, then liver cells go mad. They don't know where to grow and where to go, okay. So, that preservation of the matrix is important. Only then the liver can regenerate. What is that matrix? Why did the cells have to go into such a intricate pathway? I will be trying to tell to you in this class. So the bile is the one which is a very important product that the hepatocytes will synthesize and then produce, okay? Bile is there the product. Whereas the, the hepatocytes will do all other functions. They keep getting the uh, portal blood and then they do carbohydrate, fat and protein metabolism. They keep synthesizing proteins. That's there. But bile is something very special to them. Why? Because 
they are synthesizing bile into a separate channel that is interesting you have to understand that like for example say it is a hepatocyte now i my hands i am putting it that's a hepatocyte it will receive the portal blood it will receive hepatic artery blood so that it gives oxygen and nutrients it will get the digested absorbed nutrients so what this liver cell will do then so for example it received glucose it will store glucose in the form of glycogen for example it raises amino acids it synthesizes proteins fine it synthesizes these things and puts them into the circulation that goes into the general circulation that is towards the inferior vena cava and into the heart because ultimately heart is the one which needs to receive it but the same cell is so clever that it has segregated its work say 70% i will do this work but 30% i will do my work that is what a hepatocyte thinks so in the 30% it does another synthetic mechanism called bile it produces and puts the bile into a separate channel not into the previous channel this is important okay so that it is sending bile into a separate channel it is sending the uh, food material or toxins whatever into a separate channel such is the intelligence of a hepatocyte and for this difference or uh, the division of labor maybe i can say in each hepatocyte the anatomy of the liver is also complicated so much okay so the bile is secreted into hepatic ducts finally which join to form a common hepatic duct and then it is stored in the gall bladder for some time and via a common bile duct it enters into duodenum the opening is blocked or controlled by a sphincter of audi and hepatic artery veins and the portal veins are all the things which are coming and meeting at the liver how it is happening let us see this picture is showing you a very tiny part of the lobule of the liver you will shortly see what's a lobule okay so here what do you see is that a central vein is there in the center okay it is a vein so that means its duty is ultimately to collect the blood and take it to heart and it's not going to come back okay so into the central vein what are the channels that lead into the central vein this blue color things like rivers go and meet into a sea so this tiny rivers called sinusoids are going and meeting the central vein okay so by the sides of the river on the banks of the river i can say the hepatocytes are situated nicely so what this hepatocytes will do if whatever the things they want to send it to the general circulation they pour it into the sinusoid nearer to the central vein so what is a general thing what they want to do just now we discussed they wanted to synthesize a clotting factor say factor 8 and they synthesize this factor 8 and put it into this and that that will go into central vein goes to heart and get circulated to the entire body okay so this uh, central uh, hepatocytes but if they want to synthesize some glycogen or uh, this they want to synthesize glucose uh, they from the breakdown of glycogen or gluconeogenesis so where is the store then from where will they get they have to get it from the intestine right so from the intestine the portal vein which has collected these products of digestion it will send these uh, products into this canaliculi sorry into this sinusoids on one end so as you can see the portal vein is also emptying its contents into this river called uh, a sinusoid so in the entrance of the river these nutrients are all released so that they will be taken up by the hepatocytes as and when they require and they keep sharing the substances amongst themselves and they synthesize new things and they keep pouring it into it that's very nice and these hepatocytes also require basically some oxygen for their survival so hepatic artery is there which has come to the liver which will also split up into its capillaries and merge its capillaries into the sinusoids so the capillaries of the portal vein and the hepatic artery are merged to form a sinusoid okay so through this the oxygen will keep going to all the individual manufacturing units okay fine so now you understand the portal vein and the hepatic artery once they come into the liver they finally divide into branches 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 small branches tiny branches and ultimately 
they merge or fuse into a sinusoid or a bigger capillary like thing okay so now what is the next thing i told uh, of course from the digested material the hepatocytes will take it up they synthesize and they push it into this sinusoid river that goes into central vein and finally into the heart but they want to show there some unique mark something like you know this is my uh, ability so they show it in by means of synthesizing a substance called bile so which we have seen in detail in the last class during gi secretions i told you bile has bile acids and bile salts okay so anyways so these hepatocytes are synthesizing that bile where are they going to send it if you can see carefully the hepatocytes between each hepatocyte there are tiny tiny holes okay tiny gaps these tiny gaps are called bile canaliculi okay and they keep pouring that products into bile canaliculi and these bile canaliculi is over the entire lobule they have their own nice networking thing and they keep uniting with each other and each other uh, uh tinier things become bigger and bigger and finally they open into a duct called a bile duct and like that there are many numerous bile ducts which will ultimately form into a bigger bile duct and that goes through a hepatic duct into a gall bladder okay so as you can see a typical hepatic lobule has a central vein that means an output zone and a triad of bile duct and this which is kind of input zone on one side okay but uh, frank uh, truly speaking the bile duct is also an output from this but it is not into the general circulation no it's back into the intestines right so this is what you need to understand we, we are not going to stop here we will see the anatomy of the liver in further detail in the next two slides before that let me tell you what is the uniqueness in the portal circulation this you already know say for example in the heart from the abdom from the arch of aorta see this is the arch of aorta there is a renal vein which we saw in the previous class the vein the renal artery sorry it will go it forms afferent arteriole a capillary efferent arteriole capillaries again a venule and comes back and joins the inferior vena cava this is a kind of circuit okay say in skeletal muscle so uh, artery to the biceps will go and vein from biceps will go simply it's a usual circuit but when it comes to a portal circulation what you are seeing is from the heart if you see from the aorta there are three main branches the celiac the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric supplying different segments of the uh, gastrointestinal tract okay the liver the spleen and the stomach the pancreas small intestine colon etc so whatever these structures are producing okay the spleen the stomach the pancreas intestine colon that means the products of digestion and absorption they through the portal vein ultimately go to the liver okay so hepatic artery will bring the good amount of oxygenated blood and portal vein will get the nutrient rich blood to the liver okay so the liver will then utilize them both have its own products and sends its products through the vena cava into the heart okay or it has a special product called bile which it will send back into the intestine okay into sorry into the intestine right the micro anatomy of liver so this huge liver is shown here now let's observe a small tiny bit of it and then magnify it what is a characteristic of liver is that the tissue of the liver is arranged in benzene rings like hexagonal uh, units called lobules the liver lobules okay they are hexagonal as you can see 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 in the center of this lobule there is a, a tiny vein which is going called central vein okay so the lobule is all are having the hepatocytes now they are all hepatocytes but not just like this dots but they are arranged in a beautiful architecture which i will show you so the center of a lobule is having the central vein the central veins of all the lobules will likewise they arise they emerge and they fuse 
and they enter into hepatic vein. Okay, and these hepatic veins are the ones which empty the blood finally into the inferior vena cava. Okay, so uh, the center of a lobule, as I told, is having a, a central vein. What about the peripheries, the edges? All the six corners or the six edges of each lobule will have the arrangement of three structures, okay, called triads or a portal triad. What are they? The branch from a portal vein, a hepatic artery, and a bile duct. Okay, so all the three are there arranged in this corner. So each lobule has got six such things. And for adjacent lobules, one portal triad only is there for one, two, and three lobules now, okay? It's all a beautiful geometric arrangement. So again, in a single lobule, say maybe let us take this and then observe how the cells are oriented. The portal vein is in the center and it is opening or merging into a sinusoid, okay, as we just saw. The hepatic artery also will split into capillaries and it will fuse or merge into the sinusoids. So that the sound sinusoids are rich in oxygen as well as the nutrients. And these things are going like this, but the hepatocytes are arranged on the banks of the sinusoid, something like on the banks of a river, like we saw in the previous picture. Okay. And the bile ducts are getting uh, formed from each and tiny, tiny holes or small slits like canals, okay, as you can see, canals uh, between the hepatocytes, okay. To see the canals in a further nice good view, let us look at it. So we are looking at a portal triad now. So that is one lobule, a second lobule and a third lobule. So that thing, if you want to magnify, as you can see, so this is a sinusoid. So on all the sides of a sinusoid, the hepatocytes are present, okay? So between the hepatocytes, the canalically of the bile, the small green openings are there. And what is important you have to know is the basolateral membrane of the hepatocyte will face the sinusoid, whereas the apical membrane will face the canalically, the bile canaliculus lumen. So that means they are secreting the things into the blood from their basolateral surfaces. So just the thing what happens in the kidney also, the reabsorption occurs from the basolateral surfaces, right? So if you can see carefully from the hepatocytes, the tiny canaliculi are again fusing in a very good, beautiful uh, geometric architecture, and they are gradually uniting with each other to form Periportal, the tinier bile ducts, which will ultimately drain into a bile duct, which is there at a portal triad. Okay. Sometimes a triad ha can have one or two or more bile ducts also. But between the sinusoid and the hepatocyte, there is a nice tiny gap, and which is given a name, a very important name, a point of viva for you, space of DC. Okay. Now, these are the hepatocytes what we have seen through a complicated network of bile canaliculi, which are finally entering into a bile duct. No two hepatocytes are having any, uh, you know, are having any problem with their neighbor. They are all nicely arranged and adjusted in their own place. It's like that is what I was talking about then architecture. So it's like in the liver, an architecture is laid down. So this is a central vein. Here should be a sinusoid. Here should be a sinusoid, sinusoid, and here should be the lines for the cells and so on. Okay, such beautiful architecture is laid down and then the cells are allowed to grow and then the cells nicely go and occupy their places. So such harmony and such a teamwork, I don't think we can see anywhere, okay. So the cells are able to align in these lines because the extracellular matrix on which they are going and then getting invested is the one which is first formed. So that is why if there is any damage to hepatocytes only, not affecting the matrix, something like uh, hepatitis is there or some, a chemical damage to liver has occurred and one cell is damaged and another cell is also two cells are damaged, say. The damaged parts will be taken up by the Kupfer cells, the macrophages in the liver, and that gap will be filled by these hepatocytes by division again. They divide and they fill the gap nicely. 
but if it is due to a trauma or alcoholic hepatitis or cirrhosis which happens when there is a wide area of uh, an unorganized damage i should say and the cells are getting converted into a fibrous tissue then you can't expect such regeneration to occur okay that is to the point to be kept in your mind and of course this picture is telling you a further more detail about one hepatocyte is this side the other side how tight junctions are keeping them in place that's okay not required so it's the same picture i was telling the space of disease the disease space between this sinusoidal lumen so this is lumen it's its wall endothelial okay it's sinusoid means it's a capillary basically there are some stellate cells macrophages also will be here so between the adjacent hepatocytes the bile canal equally are like this okay and this is a little from anatomy from the liver there is right and left hepatic ducts which come and then they join the cystic duct from the gall bladder and from there they go to the common bile duct so if the liver wants to send its bile it should first send the bile from here from here and then get stored and once the signal comes the cholecystokinin or hormone will make the gall bladder contract and it will empty its contents through common bile duct into the second part of the duodenum okay now a very important slide for discussion now we saw that a uh, generalized nice good architecture is there for the hepatocytes the portal triads the hexagonal liver lobules are all arranged but if you see carefully there are three functional lobules in the liver what are the functional lobules or the zones let us see i want you to take down this notes in your notebook or somewhere in your textbook okay there is a classic hepatic lobule like this what we saw a central vein a portal triads on all six ends of it of the benzene ring like lobule and from there the liver cells are sending the blood and the flow of the blood is this way the liver cells want to the liver cells where are they they are by the sides of the sinusoids like this right so they keep producing things and they go they go into the brain no oh, sorry heart there is a portal lobule where the drains uh, the bile from the hepatocytes to the bile duct so you should see lobule 1 2 3 their corners are forming this imaginary zone this is called a portal lobule where a portal triad is in the center and into the center all bile is being uh, directed that means at any given time in the liver few lobules will be functioning as portal lobules few will be functioning as classic hepatic lobules and few will be functioning as the portal acinus okay if you look at the portal acinus can you see this this picture so this is lobule 1 and lobule 2 there are two portal triads that is hepatic artery we should consider now hepatic artery will form its branches and the capillaries are like this so in this zone the oxygen supply is the maximum okay in this zone a dark pink in color so the maximum oxygenation zone is called the zone 1 and gradually when it is reaching to the vein that is the the capillary is going to the venous side oxygen levels drop naturally and this zones are called zone 3 which are poorly oxygenated so that is an inevitable thing because owing to the structure it should happen like that but what liver cells did is intelligently they distributed their functions those liver cells which are there in the zone 1 they do certain functions and in the zone 3 they do certain other functions this is the best example for division of labor okay so what are the functions so maybe you can take a small screenshot of it or if you can write down fastly you can do that zone 1 will do certain functions where there is more oxygen right so they uh, op uh, operate certain reactions which also require energy like amino acid catabolism gluconeogenesis formation of glucose from amino acids glycogen degradation that is producing the glucose cholesterol synthesis okay urea genesis production of urea from ammonia bile acid dependent canal equilibrium flow and oxidative energy metabolism that is beta oxidation of fatty acids everything is happening in zone 1 whereas in zone 3 there is glycolysis which is being done splitting of glycogen okay uh, 
sorry, glucose and then glycogen synthesis from the glucose will happen. Uh, liponeogenesis, bile acid biosynthesis is happening in zone three and glutamine synthesis, other things, ketogenesis is happening. If you can see, uh, because we are speaking about the bile acid biosynthesis, the bile acids are hence produced near the central vein in the zone three. And from there, they will send the substances from each other through bile canal equally and they enter into the uh, bile duct, okay? Fine. So this is about zones and this is an important slide for you. Now we will see the functions of liver. So having known the complex anatomy architecture of the liver, uh, if we want to brush through the functions of liver, it's like that. The secretory function of liver is secretion of bile. The metabolic functions are many, we will see later. It synthesizes proteins like clotting factors, ac acute phase proteins, hormone binding proteins, albumin, everything is name a protein, it is produced in the liver. Synthesis of lipids, okay, carbohydrates, vitamins, bile salts, everything is happening in the liver. Storage of glucose, protein, fat, and vitamins will be happening in the liver. Detoxification, there is some dietary toxin or drugs or bacterial toxin. Say, for example, you are uh, eating, uh, uh, habituated to eat daily in a aluminum foiled bag, okay, or a packed food. So because you are not able to go to canteen or mess, or you are away from the home. So what happens after a certain time is that the hot food is put in aluminum foil and amounts of aluminum will gradually enter into your food and the levels increase. So where should this aluminum finally go and get deposited? The liver is the only uh, this thing, uh, uh, path, okay? So the liver is the only area where it can go and finally get settled. Similarly, uh, there is uh, some tinned food which is being eaten. So there is a tin uh, which is there in the uh, diet or mercury is there or lead is there. So where these things will ultimately go? So they will find their way into the liver. Liver will try to detoxify them. And if it is not happening, something like in heavy metals, they gain entry into the circulation and they show their side effects. That's why the processes due to this toxifications are quite over a long period of time. They don't happen uh, fast, okay? Uh, maybe if you remember this movie of Mahesh Babu, Kaleja, what they show is that in the river, they add that uh, pollutants and the keep, they keep drinking that pollutant and slowly they die. It's not that in a day one, everybody in the uh, village will die, okay? Something like that. But usually what liver does is if there are any other toxic materials, it will immediately detoxify. There are drugs which we are taking. So where are the drugs ultimately going after their action? Okay, they must be handled, no, they must be metabolized. So it is all happening in the liver. Degradation of drugs and chemicals, enzymes, hormones, cytokines, etc. Hormone degradation is also important or else the hormone levels will not be controlled. Okay, that's a problem. Liver causes an excretory function where it excretes cholesterol, some metals and bile pigments, okay? It converts D3 into 25 hydroxy D3, the second step in the formation of vitamin D, conversion of T4 to T3, thyroids and somatomedin. So these are some endocrine functions of the liver. Immunity, the kupfer cells which are there, they are the phagocytic, uh, reticuloendothelial, mononuclear phagocyte system. So they are helping in the immunity. Metabolic functions, if we have to see carefully, we will see uh, in detail. Coming to glucose metabolism, uh, liver does gluconeogenesis, that is from amino acids, conversion of other sugars to glucose, glycogen synthesis, and then storage. Fatty acid oxidation, products of carbohydrate metabolism to lipids, synthesis of large quantities of lipoproteins, cholesterol, phospholipids, everything regarding lipid metabolism, liver is the only destination. Protein metabolism, synthesis of all non-essential amino acids. This is important. Maybe you can put a star mark. So you know essential and non-essential, right? So non-essential are not available in the diet. So they must be synthesized. So that is what the liver is doing. And in, uh, it interconverts and deaminates certain amino acids and produce, produces glutamine sends the glutamine to the kidney, 
and it is helping in acid base balance also via liver kidney crosstalk look at the statement which is so beautifully written with the exception of immunoglobulins the liver synthesizes almost all the proteins present in the plasma and who is given the responsibility to synthesize immunoglobulins the b cells when they mature into plasma cells they produce the immunoglobulins okay liver is the critical site for disposal of ammonia and generation of urea we just discussed see when it comes to the plasma proteins it's actually very important because uh, an alcoholic person will ultimately land up in a stroke and then they die what is the reason so the person is alcoholic he has an alcoholic liver disease because of that the clotting factor synthesis is affected so because of lack in clotting factor there are spontaneous hemorrhages and hemorrhages happened in the medulla so there is stroke and there is then there is death okay so the end stage of a liver disease how that leads a person toward disability or death is quite variable okay it's diverse so anything you can suspect liver first it's like that okay i will tell you uh, sir i am having a, a headache and then uh, i'm not able to concentrate i am having reeling sensation something yes you can correlate it with the liver of course the other things are there but you can think in terms of liver okay so maybe there is some heavy metal or there is some toxin which is coming in my diet or water or in the air or something and uh, that is being toxic to me and my liver is not able to do that uh, handle that okay and that uh, is toxin is showing this vague symptoms okay so remember uh, any disease you can somehow or the other relate to the liver okay if you are not finding a good proper diagnosis all right don't think that all the diseases are liver diseases only right okay so just a note on enterohepatic circulation this we have already seen during the uh, bile secretion so just a recap because enterohepatic circulation is often coming as a 3 marks or a 5 marks question and its importance is asked so just a recap so what is it telling that the bile acids which are there are conjugated and uh, they form the conjugated uh, bile acids when they go and uh, come back into the this thing uh, intestine uh, from the um, duodenum okay part of them will be deconjugated and they will be absorbed back into the uh, circulation portal circulation they come back to the liver but uh, part of the things will deconjugate in the intestine and from there they get passively reabsorbed but most of the bile acids okay they are taken up by the enterocytes through a transporter called asbt we have seen already and this conjugated bile acids are again uh, added back into the liver so some amount of it which is uh, uh, missing out this or escaping this and entering into the colon the colonic bacteria will convert this bile acids into uh this dehydroxylase activity will convert them into deoxycholic and lithocholic okay so they try to uh, impart certain color or certain smell to the uh, fec uh, fecal matter okay 95% of the secreted bile acids and salts are reabsorbed through enterohepatic circulation if not for enterohepatic circulation what would have been there is for the amount of fats we eat okay the liver must be doubled in its size so just because enterohepatic circulation is preserving the bile uh, salts the work load on the liver is actually coming down okay now we have to talk about the jaundice before i tell you about jaundice we will let briefly see about the uh, metabolism or transit of the bilirubin in the reticulo endothelial cells of the spleen the senescent rbcs that means who have crossed their lifetime of approximately 120 days all the rbcs are killed in the spleen have you ever heard by by the way have you ever questioned ki why rbcs should be killed only in the spleen and spleen is called graveyard of rbcs why can't they be killed anywhere okay the answer is the spleen is the structure where there are tiniest of the body capillaries okay the tiniest capillaries the narrowest capillaries okay are there in the spleen 
less than 7 microns, some 6 or 5 microns. So RBC, if it has come to, towards the arterial end of the capillary, if it wants to make this journey and come back from the vein, it has to do all kinds of gymnastics inside the capillary, okay? It needs to squeeze itself and move along the capillary and come out and then feel that, oh God, I have come out, okay? So this is possible when the RBC membrane is having a good or a normal cytoskeleton framework. The spectrin molecule should be normal in amount. Because the RBC is not having nucleus, if these spectrin molecules are damaged, they can't be added back. So that is why RBC in its lifetime of 120 days, maybe it will make this transit from the splenic capillaries once, twice, thrice, and some hundred times. And by the 120th time or 130th time or whatever, the spectrins which are damaged, they cannot be recovered. No, So RBC will not be able to do this maneuver. It can't be able to cross the capillary. So eventually it will die in the capillary. Die means it breaks open in the capillary. So just by the sides of this capillary are the macrophages, the splenic macrophages. What will they do? They take up the RBCs, the phagocytos, and from there they separate it, the heme, and from the heme, the bilirubin is produced, okay? Which is unconjugated. That means a free bilirubin molecule, something like this is produced. This bilirubin, which this is happening in the spleen, no? So via the uh, splenic vein, that is a portal vein, it reaches the liver. So in the bloodstream, and some amount of it, it can escape into the general circulation also before it is come to liver and for conjugation. So this unconjugated bilirubin is complexed to albumin and it is called indirect bilirubin. So because it is not soluble in the plasma, for, for it to make it soluble, it binds to albumin. It is said like that one albumin molecule can uh, combine to four bilirubin molecules, okay? Fine. So once it is bound to albumin in the plasma, gradually then it comes to the liver. In the liver, there is a nice enzyme called uridine glucuronoyl transferase where it adds the glucuronic acid to the bilirubin. So now the bilirubin is added with an acid. So let me show it with a uh, line like this, okay? So this is what you are calling as conjugated bilirubin. So what is so interesting thing about conjugated bilirubin? It is pretty much soluble in water. It does not require to get bound to albumin. Whereas unconjugated must be bound to albumin. That is the basic and major difference, okay? So once this conjugated bilirubin is produced in the liver, what liver will do is along with the bile acids and the bile salts, it puts this conjugated bilirubin also into the bile. And from there, it goes into the intestines and gets converted into urobilinogen by the bacteria again. So what bacteria are doing? They are converting the primary bile acids into secondary bile acids. We just saw deoxycholic and lithocholic. Also, they are converting the uh, conjugated bilirubin into urobilinogen, okay? Some part of urobilinogen is further processed into stercobilin, and some amount of it goes back into the circulation and it enters into enterohepatic circulation and comes back to the liver. And so it keeps circulating like this, okay? So remember this thing. With that part in your mind, now you look at this graph. The heme bilirubin in is bilirubin is ultimately there. It gets uh, glucuronic acid is removed by the bacteria. That is the conjugation is gone. It converts it in the form of urobilinogen urobilinogen will go back into the liver. Now, uh, if you see this graph, it is showing that the urobilinogen, some part of it through portal vein enters the liver and from there into the circulation and from the kidney, it gets excreted in the urine, okay? So this is a basic idea. Keeping this as the basic idea, now let us understand the pathophysiology of jaundice. Jaundice means an yellowish discoloration of the body tissues, okay? The skin is a sclera of the eyes. Have you ever thought that why should bilirubin go and get deposited only in the eyes or only in the skin? Cannot it go and dep get deposited in the intestines, in the kidneys, in the liver itself, in the heart? Yes, it actually does. 
what you need to understand is in the blood the bilirubin level is increasing and from the blood it can go into the tissues extracellular spaces and gets and can get uh, deposited but for you to know to appreciate that something has happened what is the amenable parts which you can see it's only the hands or it's the conjunctiva okay why only these parts because relatively circulation is more here so anything which is more in the circulation is more likely to be seen or get deposited in these zones okay and it is the skin is very thin like in conjunctiva it's very thin you are able to see the sclera no so the, the white thing what you are seeing is in fact the connective tissue the conjunctiva is a transparent thing like cornea so that in the connective tissue whatever gets deposited through the transparent thing you are able to see the white turns yellow the white turns red it is easy to identify so we will choose clinically these particular parts okay so the skin and the sclera of the eyes it is getting deposited in children it is seen even in the abdominal skin you can see that yellowish discoloration okay so this accumulation of bilirubin when it is happening in the extracellular fluid it can happen either in the free form or after conjugation okay so the third point is telling you that a normal plasma concentration of bilirubin which is mostly unconjugated okay because most of the conjugated things are going into the bile it is rare to expect the conjugated to come so unconjugated bilirubin it will leave the blood because it needs to be bound to albumin i said right so it leaves the albumin and goes into the tissues and simply gets deposited there it's usually in the blood it's only 0.5 mg per deciliter here the one which is bound to albumin i mean but they appear to be discolored or appear to be jaundiced when the levels will rise to 3 mg per deciliter okay that means in the plasma to the albumin the bilirubin molecules are bound okay the unconjugated ones so normally if you measure their concentration it's around some 0.5 mg per deciliter and if their concentration increases they tend to diffuse into the tissue and to the tissue they get bound to certain tissue proteins and impart the color to that proteins okay unconjugated conjugated bilirubinemia how it will occur we will see later and even the obstructive jaundice we will see later i want to discuss in detail about this particular uh, slide and we will spend a good amount of time on this so jaundice or icterus as it is called as the yellowish discoloration of the skin and the sclera is basically of three types so as you can see and spot them hemolytic or a prehepatic jaundice hepatocellular or a hepatic jaundice and number 3 obstructive or post hepatic jaundice so when you are seeing this pre hepatic condition that means before the bilirubin enters the liver so what should happen to that before the bilirubin enters the liver means what it is not conjugated okay so this unconjugated bilirubin levels are increasing and what does it mean there is increased production of bilirubin what does it mean it means increased destruction of rbcs in the spleen why because normally you expect rbcs to become senescent after 120 days and get broken down but even before that it is happening means they are having certain problem in their membrane like it is sickle cell anemia or a spirocytosis a form of hemolytic anemia or there are certain drugs which are being taken which have a deleterious effect on rbc or the person received the blood transfusion there is a mismatched transfusion and all rbcs are lysed inside the plasma okay so this will cause the hemolysis to occur in a greater extent and hence the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia occurs this will automatically get deposited in the tissues okay and now let us see the other things what happens to the jaundice when it is a conjugated type a uh, easy thing is to talk about an obstructive jaundice or a post hepatic jaundice that means from the liver the conjugated bilirubin is produced but the, that when it is trying to go into the gall bladder and from there through the bile there is some obstruction because of that what's happening 
it is not at all able to enter into the intestine so what will you expect the first thing to happen urobilinogen will not be formed okay because only when it enters then the bacteria will act on that and then the urobilinogen or stercobilinogen are produced right so when there is obstruction when the conjugated bilirubin is not able to go from the liver and enter the intestines this is what which is going to happen now let us see where is this obstruction if it is outside the liver the reasons are there is some compression on the gall bladder there is because of a carcinoma of a pancreas or inflammation of a gall bladder or cholestasis is there because of stones which are there in the gall bladder etc or that obstruction may be somewhere within the liver we have seen a complicated anatomy architecture right so somewhere the bile ducts are being obstructed or uh, blocked because of a swelling or a fibrosis or obstruction in the liver itself when can this occur when there is cirrhosis of liver as you see the cells are being modified into a fibrous tissue so this fibrous tissue will compress the bile ducts within the liver so the conjugated bilirubin cannot leave the liver okay and what happens as a side effect this conjugated bilirubin will go back into the blood and in the blood the conjugated bilirubin levels will rise understand now coming to the third part that is the hepatocellular or hepatic so in this there is no hemolysis that means there is no uh, load of bilirubin there is no obstruction also but the liver cells are having certain problem they are being damaged due to certain reasons what are the reasons it could be a hepatitis like it happens in a viral disease or again a hepatic carcinoma liver has is growing certain cancer in that okay or there is increased unconjugated bilirubin okay because the the hepatocytes are getting damaged fine so in a hepatocellular or a hepatic damage what will be the blood picture then this is quite interesting again see when the liver cells are damaged in the initial stages so let me draw for example these are the five liver cells which have stored the conjugated bilirubin inside their stores okay and now they are being damaged so what do they do they can pour this conjugated bilirubin back into the circulation or if the liver cells are being damaged the conjugation itself cannot occur so unconjugated bilirubin also can come so that means hepatocellular both the things can increase okay so this flow chart is going to give you an overall idea about how to understand a jaundice and then this comparison uh, mostly uh, laboratory tests what we do will give you a confirmation of the type of jaundice okay so this is the same as we just discussed now uh, if you would like to you can take a screenshot of it or else it's already there in your textbook with the talk i had given to you you try to then go through this table by yourself it's a kind of self directed learning i say so that you will then analyze by yourself why is it decreasing why is it increasing okay for you i will do a one or two analysis like for example conjugated bilirubin in urine in prehepatic jaundice it is not present okay prehepatic what should happen the unconjugated bilirubin only should increase right conjugated bilirubin is normal only only when it is increased then you can expect it to be getting excreted whereas in post hepatic jaundice that means an obstructive jaundice it is definitely present okay why the conjugated bilirubin is not being able to send into the intestine so it will go back into the blood circulation and from the blood circulation it goes to the kidney gets excreted and seen in the urine and it is this conjugated bilirubin in the urine only which imparts certain dark color to the urine okay fine so i leave the rest of the points for you to just go through and try to analyze for yourselves this is the end of the class so what did we learn in this class now we have learned about the intricate functional anatomy in the liver okay and how the lobules in the liver are arranged and i said that it is on an pre established extracellular matrix that the cells have themselves got oriented 
and as long as this matrix is preserved the liver will have definitely the ability of regeneration okay so i want you to look at the functions of liver again and appreciate its importance happy learning and then thank you